Hi, and, and welcome back. Um, we were talking about continental power. And if I, I wanted to, I forgot to show this earlier, but this is a map here, which has a, yeah, actually, you can get a pretty good sense of that. I don't need to zoom in. Um, the green arrows are, are the kind of Indian removal. And this is between 1829 and 1850. So, you know, uh, uh, you can see, you know, basically Native Americans removed from the entire uh, continent. The original homeland is the green, and the arrows are the route of removal. So uh, uh, clearly then, you know, by 1850, which is after the Trail of Tears, uh, most Indians have been removed. The population, there's a population graph here. I don't know, you, the numbers on this are really wildly all over the place. But this shows in 1820, almost 500,000 Native Americans. By 1870, it's down to what is that, 278,000. So this is like, what, about a 60% decline. And the numbers are all over the place. There's a lot of demographic controversy over this but clearly there there's a huge human impact I mean especially when you take into account between 1820 and 1870 white population I think kind of doubles so if you have a a hundred percent increase in white population at the same time you have a 60 percent decrease in Indian population there's clearly you know uh, something going on there a lot of uh, native scholars uh, do refer to this as Indian genocide and that's a, a, a very uh, ardent debate within the various fields uh, about that and as I said, uh, clearly Indian removal was, was really the, the kind of basis for continental power. And then the Monroe Doctrine announces it. The idea of manifest destiny creates a consensus on America's you know, right, duty, obligation to do that. And this is uh, manifest destiny. The British will refer to something in the turn of the century as the white man's burden. It's pretty much the same thing. The idea there is that it is our burden to bring these blessings to everyone else. And this is clearly an imperial strategy. It's, it's, it's a missionary imperial strategy. And Oregon and Texas are the test cases for this. Oregon crucial because it gives uh, the Americans access to the ports of the Pacific, which ultimately could bring you to Asia, great markets of Asia. Texas, important as we know, uh, because it becomes the basis of this uh, acquisition of, of uh, lands. I think actually I have a, another map here. Uh, yeah, this is territorial expansion. Actually, I'll show this again because it goes to 1898. And let me make that a little bit bigger. But uh, um, this yellow area, yellow and, and brown striped and then yellow, is, is what's acquired uh, as a result of the Mexican-American War. And the green part is Louisiana Purchase, as I mentioned earlier. So you can see, I mean, this is a massive accumulation of territory in a very uh, short period of time. Uh, this acquired by purchase, but this is, this, these are the spoils of war, just as uh, uh, Florida is essentially uh, acquired under duress as well, Oregon by purchase. But, but this is a result of the Mexican-American War. Uh, so the United States gets these incredibly important areas, Texas, California, uh, great uh, agricultural areas. There's a huge debate over slavery. I mean, this is going to be one of the causes of the Civil War, right? You know, the cause of the Civil War is, you know, as these new territories are acquired, will they be slave territories or free territories? And so there's a big debate. Texas, of course, will be a slave territory. California will be free. Uh, so all of this ties in, and, and one of the reasons that a lot of people oppose the acquisition of, or the conquest of Texas was uh, uh, because of this, this slave um, issue. All right. Uh, so with the acquisition then of Oregon and Texas and California, the U.S. is a continental empire. It now stretches from the Atlantic uh, to the Pacific coast. But by no means is the continental empire the, the completion. There, there are much larger ambitions. And next, Americans look into the Caribbean. All right. Uh, and this is really kind of one of my favorite uh, periods, favorite aspects of history, but it's little known. In the uh, 1840s and 50s, in the period before the Civil War, a lot of Southerners hired Southern planters, essentially put together private armies. And they decided they would use these private armies to go into the Caribbean. And these guys were often referred to as filibusters. A couple people out here were talking about taking Dr. Howard's course, Phil Howard's course, and I suspect Phil may have mentioned the filibusters at one time because these guys are kind of legendary throughout Latin America. Americans don't know anything about it. Latin Americans know a lot about it. A filibuster is a private army. Essentially, southern bankers, southern businessmen, southern cotton planters put together these private groups, these mercenary groups. Why would they do that? To send them into the Caribbean to try to acquire new lands. Why did they want new lands? In particular, because 
uh, 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 the slave controversy in the U.S. was making it more and more difficult to expand and bring your slaves into new territory. So they're thinking the Caribbean is great for that, right? We can have slaves there. We can have huge agricultural plantations. And there's already an infrastructure in places like uh, uh, Sundom, you know, Haiti or, or, or Cuba. You already have, uh, uh, you know, massive sugar plantations. So there's already an infrastructure and you can bring your slaves in there. But you can't, you know, the U.S. Army is going to do it. You know, the Union Army is not going to go into to the Caribbean and take over an island and create a, a slave state there or anything like that. So what you see then is um, these, uh, the, the creation of these um, filibusters, these, these private armies uh, uh, put together by southern planters and businessmen, bankers, uh, who want to attack Latin American nations in hopes of extending this southern slave empire. The southerners, and you know, I don't want to go too much into southern history, but a lot of southerners see themselves as a distinct society. So they're not part of the United States, they're the south. So often southerners actually kind of, their conception of empire is different. It's not a national empire, it's a southern or Caribbean slave empire. And so this is essentially what we're talking about here, the creation of this um, uh, southern um, uh, a slave empire, and the southerners really feel besieged, they're losing power, they're under attack, so they're going to move into the Caribbean on their own. Um, and so they put together these private armies. Uh, uh, the two most famous episodes occur, one in Cuba, one in Nicaragua, which is ironic, right, For in, in terms of the later 20th century. In 1849, uh, uh, a bunch of these southerners got a Cuban general, a guy named Narcisco Lopez, and they, they put him up to putting together an army. He promised uh, uh, these veterans uh, plunder, women, drink, and tobacco, as well as money and land once they took over Cuba. And um, uh, the Lopez, the first time he tries to, to go to Cuba uh, and attack, the Navy blockades him. But then in 1851, he leaves from the port of New Orleans and he goes to Cuba with this ragtag army of drunken veterans of the Mexican-American War. And the Cubans meet him at the beach and slaughter him. The Spanish meet him at the beach and slaughter him. It's kind of like what you'd see in the Bay of Pigs a hundred and some years later. And it's kind of laughable, but you know, obviously for Lopez it was quite serious. And for the Cubans and the Spanish and the Nicaraguans and everybody affected, it was quite serious. Uh, if Lopez is kind of the comic foil, uh, uh, the, the real you know, kind of a star of this uh, particular episode is a guy named William Walker. William Walker... Uh, was uh, a, 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 a medical doctor, a physician from Tennessee, who put together a private army. And initially he actually attacked Baja, California. He was arrested, but then he got off. And then he went to Nicaragua. And he started a private army and actually takes over Nicaragua. He and his private army of filibusters takes over Nicaragua. And uh, um, enslaved, basically create a, a slave society. The entire country is enslaved working for Walker. And the U.S. government recognizes Walker as the official government of Nicaragua. All right? So, I mean, this is, I mean, it sounds crazy, but in fact, William Walker was the, like, the dictator of Nicaragua and officially recognized as such by the U.S. government, by President, I think it was Pierce at the time in 1850, late 1850s or something like that. Ultimately, uh, Walker overplays his hand. Uh, they, they are so despised by the native population because, I mean, they're raping and looting and gambling and uh, there's a big outbreak of VD which knocks out about half of his troops and ultimately Walker is deposed. He's sent back to the U.S. He comes back again, tries to take over Honduras. At that point, uh, uh, the Latin Americans catch him and, and I believe they uh, hang him. They execute him. All right, but I mean, the the, the Southerners actually succeeded for a time in taking over and and, and and you know getting recognition of Nicaragua as an American possession, with this crazy doctor from Tennessee in charge. All right, so we can kind of laugh at the filibusters, but in fact, this had real meaning. And these Southerners spent a lot of money trying to inculcate these ideas into the Caribbean and this goal of acquiring a a, a Caribbean empire. Even more important, however. The federal government actually had a role uh, to play in this as well. In 1854, three American diplomats were in Belgium at a place called Ostend. And um, they got together, and the real goal here was Cuba. Right? Cuba is huge in American dreams and ambitions, just as it is today. What's happening in Cuba today is nothing new. 
Cuba was always big, it was already developed, it had an infrastructure, so the southerners craved Cuba. They always wanted to bring Cuba into their Caribbean slave empire. So in 1854, three American diplomats got together, the diplomats to Spain and Britain and France, and they met at Belgium, and they issued what they called the Ostend Manifesto. And in it, they said that the United States will offer Spain $120 million to buy Cuba. We're going to offer Spain $120 million to buy Cuba. What if Spain says no? What if Spain says no? What does the Ostend Manifesto say? The U.S. is justified, quote, by every law, human and divine, to simply take it. So this is an American diplomatic memorandum which says, we'll offer Spain $120 million for Cuba, and if they turn us down, we are justified by every law, human and divine. Once again, God wants us to take Cuba to take it. All right? Now, it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that we keep hearing about uh, uh, 2002's attack, or the last year's, I'm sorry, attack on Iraq is preemptive war. This is new, right? This is something new. This is departure, preemptive war. I mean, what's, what's more preemptive than saying, we're going to come in and take your country if you don't sell it to us? It didn't happen at the time, basically because the sectional conflict between the North and South, Kansas and Nebraska, I dread, Scott, all that stuff kind of erupted and, you know, everybody had to kind of focus inward and they couldn't, you know, have these dalliances in the Caribbean. But clearly, uh, uh, as part of kind of this, this overarching imperial ethic, no one thought twice about simply uttering, issuing this statement that said, we have every right to Cuba and we'll take it from you, right? Nothing is more preemptive than that, right? So... Clearly then, I mean, these expansionist ideas are nothing new. And when we talk about Cuba, we'll talk about the Bay of Pigs and Castro's Revolution and everything else. You've got to think about this stuff. I mean, in, in, the, eight, in the 1980s, um, Nicaragua had a revolution, and they put into a power a leftist government called the Sandinistas. And Reagan immediately went after them, all full flames, just destroyed the Sandinistas. And, and no one had ever heard of, really, William Walker, and you started to kind of get a little bit about him. But in Nicaragua, everybody knew who William Walker was. And in Cuba, people know who Narcisco Lopez was. And people are familiar with the Plata Amendment and other, you know, examples of America's role in that region in ways that here in North America, uh, we aren't. So uh, ask the people of Nicaragua what terrorism is and if William Walker qualifies. Just as an, a, a kind of a funny little sidelight to that. In the 1980s, um, when Reagan was going after the Sandinistas and crushing them, he appointed a diplomat to the Organization of American States whose name was William Walker. And this was just a way, it would be like appointing, you know, like Hitler to something in Israel or something like that to the Nicaraguans. So, yeah. I've read that it was uh, the a common saying in Mexico is poor Mexico is so near the U.S. so far from God. Yeah, they've they been saying that forever. So far from God, so near America, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ask, ask the Latins if uh, preemptive war has uh, taken place before 2003, right? So. Uh, but these filibusters, I mean, this is really, really important stuff. I mean, you know, it sounds kind of goofy, but in fact, what we have are private armies attacking sovereign states. And in the case of Nicaragua, actually literally enslaving the entire population for a time, for a few years, with the official, official sanction of the U.S. government in Washington, D.C. Well, Spain as well, because I know Spain has a slave population did Spain already, the Spanish already abolished slavery in Spain? Mm, earlier? In Spain, yeah. I think Cuba was actually after, wasn't it? In Cuba. Cuba. I think Cuba was after, no, wasn't it? The, no, the, the Spanish never abolished slavery. It was the Latin American countries right. after declaring independence. After the independence. So Nicaragua was independent since 1810. Right. It had been independent. But Cuba but, was still a, a Spanish colony. Right. And it had, at least half the population was black and, and enslaved. But that was, and they, they, they did abolish slavery though. Uh, 1890s. That was before that, wasn't it? I thought it was, I thought Brazil was actually last. No, no 18, it was in the 1880s. Was it? Brazil okay. was last in 1880. Oh, 1880s, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was the 1880s, right. but it was gradual. They actually remained in yeah. until yeah. the So the filibusters were after? The filibusters were like the 1850s, 1840s and 1850s. Yeah, so and I mean, the filibusters wanted to expand American slavery into all these areas. Yes, right. but they, they also chose these regions because they had plantations. In yeah, they're, they're already developed. And they had a very large uh, uh, black populations. Mm -hmm. Which they uh, and, and that's why the beauty of Cuba is it's there. 
I mean, it's already there. You don't really have to, you know, it's, it's really easy because you just take it over and the, you already have the infrastructure. You have the plantations, you have the commercial interest, you have the traders, and you have the slaves. Yeah. So, uh, uh, um, but again, I mean, in terms of this kind of globalizing mission, this is, you know, for the 19th century, this is really, really critical. Uh, 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 the Ostend Manifesto and the filibusters are stymied by the onset of the Civil War, but the Civil War is really important, and this kind of takes us into the modern era. Uh, the course is actually supposed to begin in 1898, but, but you can't really do that. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of times these classes begin in 1898, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, you know, without this background, even though it's, 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 you know, kind of complicated and I'm flying through it, I think you really kind of have to know this to set up these themes. The Civil War is really important because the Civil War is kind of the, the triumph of industrial capitalism. Prior to the Civil War, the U.S. was split. I mean, you had clearly the North, which was industrializing and had been for some time, but in the South, you had more of kind of a feudal agricultural system. And who wins the Civil War and why? The Union wins. The North wins. Why? Because it has overwhelming capital. Overwhelming capitalist power. It has more capital. It has more banks. It has more factories. It has more railroad mileage. It has more industry. It can build more weapons. It can build more, more, more guns. It can produce more bullets. It can get troops to the front faster. It can take wounded troops away from the front faster. That's why, more than anything, the North won the war. It would be difficult to see the North not winning the war. Rarely, I mean, the Vietnam War obviously being a, a, an exception, does the country with overwhelming industrial power not emerge triumphant, and that clearly is the case. So, uh, 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 in the Civil War then, you see this triumph of industrial capitalism, as well as what we would later day call the military-industrial complex. You start to see the government and private defense and military companies working very closely together to develop a national policy. Much of the war is actually funded through British capital because the Americans don't have that kind of money to fund a major war like that. But then they use it and they start to develop these industries which work you know, in, in armaments and, and the implements of war. And they work very closely with the government. And war contracts are really critical to, um, to uh, have a little uh, techno glitch here, um, are really critical then to developing uh, uh, not just the ability to win the war, but also the, um, the economy. OK. Um, I guess if I don't touch it every so often, I'll have to, it kind of goes under. Um, as examples of this, I have some data, I should have put it on there. But in 1870, the U.S. was producing 20,000 tons of coal a year. By 1900, it's 212,000 tons. And these are just numbers. If you want to take them down, you can. But, you know. but it, uh, coal production, 1870, 20,000 tons of coal. 1900, 212,000 tons of coal. By 1910, 417,000 tons of coal. Massive industrial output. We're going to see in a minute why this is important. Uh, rolled steel in 1870, 14,000 tons a year of steel. By 1900, 303,000 tons of steel. And by 1910, 544,000 tons. Massive increase in steel production. Industrial machinery in 1870, right after the Civil War ends, $117 million worth of industrial machinery. By 1912, $512 billion of industrial machinery. In 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, the United States was the fourth greatest manufacturing country behind Britain, France, and Germany. By 1900, the manufacturing output of the U.S. exceeded all of those three combined. The U.S. had about 200,000 miles of railroad, which was more than all of Europe combined. All of that points to the establishment as Jefferson and Hamilton and Gallatin and all of the founders envisioned it of a great liberal empire, an industrial empire with ambitions abroad. All right? And so at the time of the Civil War, at the conclusion of the Civil War, the U.S. clearly is on a path then toward global power. All right? And it's going to kind of assume that uh, responsibility, you know, this is kind of an era of manifest destiny, right, very quickly. Um, and so I want to talk a, a little bit about that, all right. Um, I just mentioned all those huge numbers on, on uh, manufacturing. 
incredible increases between, you know, from 20,000 tons of coal to 417,000, from 14,000 tons of steel to 512,000, 500 and some billion dollars worth of uh, uh, machinery, industrial machinery. That's good, right? You're producing more, you're making more stuff, okay? Well, it surely shows incredible exponential growth in output, but it also points to a growing problem one that will lead to a far more aggressive and imperial approach by American leaders. Okay? Uh, the 1890s, two generations after the Civil War, uh, uh, the incredible economic growth occasioned by the war uh, becomes a major problem. In the 1890s is a period beset by great crisis. In fact, the entire period after the Civil War was a time of great economic disarray. From the period after the Civil War to the 1890s, at least half of the time the country was in some form of economic depression or recession or panic. And there were crises over currency, whether you would use paper money, the greenbacks, or go to a gold economy or a silver-based economy. All kinds of stuff is going on. So by the 1890s, people are restless. You have labor unions trying to organize. You've had massive strikes, national strikes in 1877, Haymarket in 1886, Homestead and Pullman in the 1890s. On the prairie, you have uh, uh, the, the kind of eruption of populism. Farmers, as one farmer said, it's time to raise less corn and more hell. What you have is essentially in the cities and on the farms, the emergence of a class-based politics. Workers and farmers are seeing themselves now as a class in contradistinction to the people who are running the country, the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Goulds and the Vanderbilts and the Harrimans, right? The economy is doing badly. Why? Because of those numbers I just gave you. Those numbers indicate that there was a problem of too much production, overproduction. Right? So in the 1890s, this all kind of creates kind of a perfect storm economically. Bad depression. Bankruptcies are at a record pace. Profits are dropping. Why? The key problem is overproduction. In all industries, but especially in manufacturing, also in agriculture, businesses are producing too much stuff. Too much steel, too many railroad cars, too many machine tools, too many factories. Why is that a problem? What's, what's wrong with that? Somebody's got to buy it, right? There's not, enough, there's not enough demand, right? So nobody's buying this stuff, so what's that mean? You need more markets, right? Right now, you need to create you need to create a consumer side, but this isn't these aren't consumer goods. I mean, you don't you're not going to go buy a railroad, are you? Right? So you need to figure out how to deal with this problem. Now, in addition to overproduction, and I'm kind of swapping these out. I really should have had this before that one. But in addition to overproduction, okay, according to capitalism, capitalist theory, all right, you take your money, you build a factory, you produce stuff, you sell it. What do you do then with that money? <coughs> you reinvest it. What's that called? That money you reinvest is called? It's not just money, it's what? Capital. It's capital. If I take a dollar out of my pocket, is that capital? No. Nah. If, if I buy a lottery ticket with it, is that capital? No. Right? Capital is actually money that you use to reinvest. It's money you use to essentially fertilize, or as Woody Clinton always said, grow the economy. That's what capital is. Now, if that money isn't being used for further economic activity, if it's sterile, that's called surplus capital. As a result of overproduction, you also have a concomitant crisis of surplus capital. There is more capital in existence than productive forces can absorb. That sounds highfalutin. It's really simple stuff. You have more money than you can invest productively. That's all it means. All right? Now, for you or I, Excess money may be a good thing, right? We can put it in a bank account or put it away for a vacation or, you know, buy a midlife crisis motorcycle with it or something like that. Not, not knowing I know, right? But for a company, for a major, you know, industrial or banking concern, surplus capital can be a problem because it sits there. What do you do? You invest it in securities, you, you know, but, but, you know, that doesn't really produce anything. The idea behind capitalism, you have to continually produce things, grow the economy, 
production is key. If you don't produce, if you don't grow, you die. The one thing about capitalism is kind of an inexorable law is you need constant exponential growth. I mean, not exponential, but you need constant growth. So that's not happening in the 1890s. In addition to that, people are ticked off. You have farmers creating you know, political groups like the Grange and the Farmers Alliance and the Populist. You have workers and the Knights of Labor going on strike. All hell's breaking loose. You know, Railroad strikes, homestead pullment. A group of unemployed workers led by a guy named Jacob Coxey uh, uh, march on Washington, D.C., demanding unemployment relief, Coxey's army. Uh, the populist, you know, fire on the prairie. All hell's breaking loose, right? So as a result of that, people are saying, what are we going to do? We've got to do something here. These are really serious problems. We're really in trouble. Uh, uh, there's this fear of, of a great revolution. The Attorney General, Richard Olney, said, our founding fathers went too far with their conceptions of liberty. All right? Democracy is now the enemy of law and order. Right? The, meaning that, that people who are demanding, you know, demanding their fair share, de wanting better wages, uh, 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 wanting, uh, you know, voting or, or, or banking rights, that, they've gone too far. They're the enemy of law and order. So there's really a crisis. You have this major structural change in the economy, and as a result of that, people are saying, what are we going to do? So this is where you have the development of these theorists of empire, these smart guys. These are the guys who are on Tim Russert or, or uh, you know, CNN or Smartline with Kent Brockman or something like that. And they're the ones who are going to kind of create, again, the ideological basis for uh, 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 American imperialism. And I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, the first person uh, I want to mention is, is Frederick Jackson Turner because he's a historian, mostly. In very few of us have ever done anything of great value in the world like Frederick Jackson Turner has. Uh, but Turner had what he called the frontier thesis. Turner looked at uh, um, census data. And what he found was that by 1890, the whole country was filled up. Everybody was living in the whole country from coast to coast. Now, when things turned badly, when you were out of work or when life got tough, one way you could always kind of avoid that was move west, right? Go west, young man. Well, by 1890, that frontier is closed up. So what do you have to do? If your frontier is closed, you find a new frontier, right? So this becomes part of the basis for it. Let's move abroad. Another aspect of that um, uh, uh, is kind of a religious, we talked about that before, there's kind of a religious uh, aspect to it. Along with that, there's also the element of, of uh, social Darwinism, which is kind of, you know, kind of tied into that. What's social Darwinism? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, you, you know evolutionary right. destiny, right? It's, it's very similar to manifest destiny, isn't it, in a sense? Stronger, survive, you know, we, we have this kind of uh, 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 social, social Darwinism, it's kind of an offshoot of biological Darwinism, it becomes very popular in the late uh, uh, 19th century where people say it is our destiny as Anglo-Saxons to go out and to find new areas to conquer. This is how we survive. At the same time you have missionaries saying that. There was a well-known Congregationalist minister named Josiah Strong. Strong had a best-selling book about the need for American missionaries to go into the third world to convert people um, to Christianity. Um, so a, a lot of this is, is really kind of this, uh, uh, um, you know, kind of impressionistic, ethereal kind of stuff. The Washington Post in the 1890s kind of described this uh, in, in an editorial. They said, a new consciousness seems to have come upon us, the consciousness of strength, and with it a new appetite, the yearning to show our strength, ambition, interest, land hunger, pride, the mere joy of fighting. Whatever it may be, we are animated by this new sensation. We are face to face with a strange destiny. The taste of empire is in the mouth of people, as even as the taste of blood in the jungle. All right, so it's just this kind of psychological, almost a psychosexual thing, right? We have this this taste of empire is in our our blood. So clearly, then there's this this you know kind of social Darwinism, manifest destiny, missionary aspect. We're, we're stagnant at home. We have all these problems at home. We have people in the streets and we have unemployed people and farmers and the populace really scared the hell out of a lot of folks because they were a, an integrated group. They had black and white farmers working together for a time, running for office, sharing a platform. 
that kind of thing. Scared the hell out of people. Very powerful in the South especially. So there's this sense that things are wrong and we're, we're in trouble. It's just a bad vibe all over. And so, you know, we need to kind of become renewed, become vigorous. It's the kind of stuff that you hear. It, you know, if, if you ever look at JFK's uh, inaugural address in 1961, it's the same thing. In fact, at Kennedy's inaugural, uh, he has Robert Frost read a poem which is all about manifest destiny. You know, the land was ours before we were the lands. That's what Frost says. The land was ours before we were the lands. Right? How is that different than what they're talking about here? So clearly then, there, there's this sense that, 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 that the U.S. has to do this. Uh, a well-known author named Brooks Adams uh, wrote a book. I don't think I have that on there now. Uh, Brooks Adams wrote a book called The Law of Civilization and Decay. Think about that. Talk about social Darwinists, right? The Law of Civilization and Decay. Right? So what is the implication there? Well, or the alternative is you either civilize or you decay. Right? You have to keep moving. You have to civil and what does civilization mean? What does it mean to civilize? I mean, you know, learning, you know, which, which fork to use for salad or, you know, how to put your fingers in a soup bowl, you know. No, it means take over new lands, civilize, bring this social Darwinist experiment to people who aren't white. I mean, there's clearly a racial component to it as well. So all of that is really important. But what's the real basis for this? The real basis for this is materialist. Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a really well-known senator from uh, Massachusetts, said, in the interest of our commerce, this is at one point, we'll talk about this more later, we're talking about, they were talking about building a canal in order to trade. In the interest of our commerce, we should build a Nicaraguan canal. And for the production of that canal, and for the sake of our commercial supremacy in the Pacific, we should control the Hawaiian Islands and maintain our influence in Samoa. And when the Nicaraguan canal is built, the island of Cuba will become a necessity. The great nations are rapidly absorbing for their future expansion and their present defense all the waste places of the earth. Waste. W-A-S-T-E. This is how Lodge refers to them, all the waste places of the earth. It is a movement which makes for civilization and the advancement of the race. As one of the great nations of the world, the United States must not fall out of line of march. I mean, can you believe that? That's, you know, that's just incredible. And when the canal is built, Cuba will become a necessity. The great nations are rapidly absorbing for their future expansion and their present defense all the waste places of the earth. It is a movement which makes for civilization and for the advancement of the race. As one of the great nations of the world, the United States must not fall out of the line of march. Right? I mean, what, isn't that an incredible statement? But again, huh? Exactly. Well, and then actually, I was kind of setting up because I was like, is that really anything different, anything different than what you've heard Ashcroft and you know Pearl and some of these guys say in the past two or three years? Well, why would they think that way? Exactly. Yeah, they're being yeah. Superior, so. yeah. I was kind of doing it for theatrical flair, but, but in fact, <laughs> no, no. But the point is, I mean, no, look at that and compare it to the rhetoric you've heard in the last few years, right? Uh, I mean, uh, somebody earlier, there's a, there's a one on a book by Samuel Huntington called Clash of Civilizations, which came out in the late 90s, which essentially talks about it, and using these terms, the rhetoric isn't quite as, as abrasive, but it's, it's a real similar idea, you know, that, you know, I mean, you know, you have you know, Ashcroft and fundamentalist Christians and people like that who, who use very similar rhetoric, I mean, whether you like them or not, right? So, there's clearly this sense then that, you know, the U.S. has these interests, and if it doesn't act now, then it's only going to get worse, right? Uh, uh, one of the major, uh, another major uh, uh, an important person uh, in this was a, uh, a banker named Charles Conant. And Conant was actually an advisor to people like, you know, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and others. And Conant was a real uh, 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 big advocate of dealing with the problem of surplus capital. And Conant kept pointing out that there's all this extra money, and what do you do with it? I mean, this is really key. You have to find new areas to invest. You have to find new markets. Conant, in particular, said China's the key to all this, because China's big, and China's underdeveloped. China's essentially primitive at the time, according to Conant. So this is something else that's, that's very important. Um, and pretty soon there's kind of an, there's just a generally accepted idea, a consensus, that the key to ending this crisis of the 90s will be to find new outlets. William McKinley said, we want a foreign market for our surplus products. 
who was William McKinley. He was a very influential uh, congressman from Ohio and then president. All right? Albert Beveridge of Indiana, another well-known senator, said, American factories are making more than the American people can use. American soil is producing more than they can consume. Fate has written our policy for us. The trade of the world must and shall be ours. And who determined that? Fate. Who is fate? Fate is God. Fate is manifest destiny. I mean, God so far has told them to take Cuba, has told them to take, get rid of the Indians, to kill the Pequots, and now he's telling them to expand trade. All right? I think God could have been the head of the Federal Reserve in a, in a different time and place. Uh, the Department of State said, it seems to be conceded that every year we shall be confronted with an increasing surplus of manufacturing goods for sale in foreign markets. If American operatives and artisans, American workers, are to be kept employed the year round, the enlargement of foreign consumption of the products of our mills and workshops has therefore become a serious problem of statesmanship as well as commerce. Already, even before this, American um, uh, exports in uh, uh, farming goods and tobacco and cotton exceeded almost all the countries of the world. And that still wasn't enough because the problem of overproduction was so great. Uh, new investments by 1895 were reaching over a billion, when a billion dollars meant something. It's not like, you know, Bill Gates' pocket money. You know, billion dollars in 1895 was a significant amount of money. And already new investments abroad were a billion dollars, and that still wasn't enough. The problem of surplus capital was so great. Um, steel becomes a major export. Oil becomes a major export. Uh, uh, farming uh, uh, commodities become a major export. That still isn't enough. So you have a chronic problem of overproduction uh, along with overproduction. What does overproduction do to the prices? They, there's a problem of deflation, actually. Prices don't go up, they actually go down. So there are some major issues, the major problems that have to be dealt with. What do you do? All right. All of these people, you know, Josiah Strong and Brooks Adams and, and uh, you know, all of these guys who I just mentioned, Mahan and Conant, all have the same solution, go abroad. Find new places whether they be places for missionaries or whether they be places for markets, it doesn't matter because it's pretty much the same thing anyway. So the solution becomes find new markets. There were other alternatives, weren't there? I mean, you had people in Europe like Lenin talking about <clears throat> worldwide socialist revolution. The Americans aren't going to do that. You had the German solution, which is essentially a closed system. But the Americans do something different. They want to develop this economic revival through trade through free commerce. They want to be able to go anywhere in the world and sell goods and invest surplus capital and find consumers and find resources. And the key to all that is to do it without barriers. What is this called? What's the title of the course? This is called it's globalization, isn't it? Globalization doesn't have to be the WTO or in 1999 in Seattle. This is globalization. This is clearly a conscious program planned out to create kind of a, a American reach all over. All right? Globalization to a lot of people is simply a nice word for, what else could we call this? Imperialism. Imperialism. Right, right. And again, I mean, you know, I think as we go on, these things will just come to you. I won't even have to point it out. So in the 1890s then, the United States facing these problems of global, uh, you know, uh, crisis, you know, overproduction, surplus capital, producing just way too many goods. If you're making too much stuff and you can't sell it, you know, you have real economic problems. So what's it going to do? It's going to acquire an empire by force and by commerce. All right. The first place, places it's going to act will be in Cuba and the Philippines. But even before that, uh, the US has an interest in Hawaii. Uh, and I just want to briefly go over that. Hawaii is kind of an interesting case study. And, and again, history books don't talk about it much. And I wish I could spend more time on it. The first Americans that arrived in Hawaii in the 1820s. Hawaii at the time was an independent kingdom. And who were the first Americans to go to Hawaii? White, what, what, yeah, but before that, missionaries. 
for the missionaries, okay? And they go there, and all of a sudden, what do the missionaries discover? They discover there's a lot of sugar in Hawaii, and so they become sugar planters. So by the 18 post-Civil War period, post-American Civil War period, what you have in Hawaii uh, is an economy dominated by white sugar growers, sugar planters, all right? Now, increasingly, what does this mean for the native Hawaiians? How does it affect them? They're out of work, they're not paid well, it becomes an e really difficult. I mean, you have a really stratified economic social system in Hawaii with these white planters who control everything, and things like Dole, the Dole uh, uh, Fruit Company, and then you have the majority of Hawaiians who don't. So, uh, uh, and by law and by trade policy, the U.S. is acquiring more and more control, not over just the Hawaiian economy, but really over the entire Hawaiian political system. It gets to the point where Hawaii essentially is losing its sovereignty. The U.S. essentially is telling Hawaii what to do. So in 1891, I believe, a new monarch comes to power, a queen named Lilia Kalani. And I think there's a link on this webpage later on to, or it's in the syllabus, right? To, uh, to that. Lydia Kalani is a nationalist and she's upset at this. She doesn't want Hawaii to fall under the thumb or the jackboot of American imperialism. I don't think they were using that phrase at the time. So Lilia Kalani is a nationalist who's standing up for Hawaiian rights. What happens to her? What happens to her? She's, she's overthrown, but it's even better than that because who overthrows her? Don't. Yeah, I mean, and who gives the order? It was a minister told the Marines to, to overthrow the Queen. This minister, he tells the queen. And who do they put in charge? Dole. Sanford Dole, right? And who put him in charge? The government. The government. The American government, right? So I, what you do, luckily it was a bloodless coup, but the Americans, um, an American minister gave an order to Marines who were in, in, in the harbor to go in and overthrow the queen, which they did. And then they put in a, a, an American uh, a, a fruit man, Sanford Dole, in as governor of Hawaii. All right. I mean, you know, at least in, in Iraq, they're going through the pretense of Chalabi and so on. You know, they've gone through five or six guys already. Pretty soon, Billy Martin and George Steinbrenner will get their turn. But, but, but you know, they put Sanford Dole in charge. Okay. So, I mean, this is one way of doing it, right? In Cuba and the Philippines, it's a little more coercive. These were Spanish colonies. Right? And in Cuba, there had been a revolt against Spanish rule for some time. And the Americans actually, uh, and this is kind of ironic, were uh, very cleverly exploiting the anti-imperial idea that was prevalent in Cuba. The Cubans wanted the Spanish out. This is Spain's last colony, Cuba and the Philippines. Spain has you know, really kind of fallen on tough times, right? So... Um, uh, 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 the United States is deeply interested in Cuba. Uh, Grover Cleveland, the president in 1896, said, it is reasonably estimated that at least from 30 million to 50 million dollars of American capital are invested in the plantations and in railroad mining and other business enterprises on the island. The volume of trade between the U.S. and Cuba, which in 1889 amounted to about 64 million, rose in 1893 to about 103 million. Keep in mind, too, those numbers may not seem great today, 100 million bucks, but in, in, in 1893, that's a really significant uh, amount of money. As a result of that, the U.S. clearly then has real significant um, um, economic interests in Cuba. It's suffering from economic depression at home. And in addition to that, the U.S. being liberal imperialist, what is their sense on Spain and European imperialism? What do they think of that? See, there's a great irony here. At the same time that the Americans are, are imperialist, they also are legitimately anti-imperialist because they, their critique of European imperialism is, is genuine. They think it's a disaster. They think it's wrong for the Spanish to come in and simply impose their will over Cuba, all right? By force, by coercion, by occupying armies. So the U.S. can genuinely say, we're anti-imperialist in Cuba, all right? We'll get to see why. There's, there's obviously a, a, an inconsistency there. Huh? But, 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 no, there's not, but it's not a contradiction. They really are genuinely anti-imperialist. They think European imperialism is wrong. It's not nearly as effective as liberal imperialism. I mean, that's the point. When we get to the open door, I think it'll make more sense. But basically, their, line of way, their, their way of thinking is, if we can send people in there and trade and, and, and establish a, a dependent economy, we're way better off than if we had to send in occupying armies and put our people in charge. They get shot at. They won't like us. Right? When I mean, you see that today in Iraq, right? 
the, the U.S. is also it's necessarily anti-imperialist because at the same time they're they're competing for resources that are being gobbled up quickly by the British. And they don't have the they don't have the military means nor the geography. To so what? To, they don't have the force to get in. No, so right. to they pursue have to the liberal yeah. agenda, they have to be anti-imperialist in, in at least in the sense of traditional imperialism. What's America's strength? What's the American strength in the 1890s? We've just talked about it. I mean, it's the problem of uh, what's the problem of the crisis? Overproduction. Which means that America's strength is it can produce more than anybody else in the world, right? Economically, the U.S. surpasses everybody else. That's its strength. What is its shortcoming? It doesn't have the physical means to go into other areas and take it over. I mean, this is why Mahan and our Lodge was talking out for Thayer Mahan and Admiral. One of the big things there was we need a big navy, right? Why do you need a big navy? To escort commercial ships and to take over areas. And if you have a big navy, you need coaling stations. That's one reason Hawaii is important, because Hawaii is about halfway between California and, and uh, uh, you know, Japan and China. So when you're going over there, you need to stop halfway to recoal and then go, go on. So, I mean, America's you know, a, a, a asset is its, its economic strength. And so it has to be anti-imperial then, because imperialism and the, 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 the free market are quite different. Now, the way they treat people obviously, you know, is, is, is pretty much indistinguishable. And I mean, in one hand, you think, oh, that's a technical, you know, difference. But in fact, it's, it's really telling, right? I mean, the American critique of imperialism is genuine and it's on target. And so when the Cubans hear it, they love it. And like, hey, the Americans are our saviors. And the Cuban nationalists have great media. I mean, Hearst, you know, writes them up and Jose Marti comes to the United States and they raise a bunch of money in the U.S. Uh, as well. And in addition to that, the business community starts to press for intervention. Um, uh, in a commercial newspaper, a business paper in New York, they said that uh, the U.S. should intervene in Cuba for humanity and love of freedom and above all, the desire that the commerce and industry of every part of the world shall have full freedom of development in the whole world's interest. So let's open a market of Cuba for the whole world's interest. Okay. And, and so this becomes kind of a common uh, uh, thread throughout this period. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, influential senator, writes to William McKinley, the president, sends him a letter saying he had just talked with bankers, brokers, businessmen, editors, clergymen, and others. And everybody wanted intervention in Cuba. Lodge said, they said for business, one shock and then an end was better than a succession of spasms, such as we must have if this war in Cuba went on. Business is telling Lodge, go in there, finish it off, get it over with. It's best for us that way. William McKinley got a, a telegram from an advisor saying, big corporations here now believe we will have war, believe all would welcome it as a relief to the suspense. All right. As a result of that, uh, uh, and the public uh, uh, furor after an American ship, the Maine, was blown up. The Americans do declare war. Uh, later, uh, when surveying the rush toward war in 1898, the Bureau of Foreign Commerce and the Department of Commerce wrote about what had happened. Uh, these words, underlying the popular sentiment against Spain going for war in Cuba. Underlying the popular sentiment, which might have evaporated in time, which forced the United States to take up arms against Spanish rule in Cuba, were our economic relations with the West Indies and South American republics. The Spanish-American War was but an incident of a general movement of expansion, which had its roots in the changed environment of an industrial capacity far beyond our domestic powers of consumption. It was seen to be necessary for us not only to find foreign purchases, purchasers for our goods, but to provide the means of making access to foreign markets easy, economical, and safe. And not the most poetic language, but what is that saying? What is he talking about? What is the Bureau of Foreign Commerce saying? He's basically saying that this is an episode in globalization, that it was important for the American economy in a global sense, at least a regional sense, not just with regard to investments in Cuba, but in order to maintain economic activity throughout that region. And that's something that you have to think kind of systemically here. And, and we'll talk about this again. I mean, Cuba's important clearly because the U.S. has hundreds of millions of dollars at stake there in trade or in investment. But even more than that, Cuba is important because in a free trade system, Cuba trades not only with the U.S. and the U.S. not only invades Cuba, but other South American countries do. And this creates economic activity regionally with regard to Europe globally. 
And that's really critical because if you're going to have this liberal, open system where you trade and invest without barriers, you need as many countries participating in it as possible. That's why we call it globalization. This is why they can genuinely say we're anti-imperialist because if you have an imperial relationship, who do you trade with only? Yourself. Yourself in the mother country, right? It's a, it's a closed system. Toward that end, is, and this is kind of a, a sneak preview, in the mid 20th century, who was America's greatest rival? Russia. Not Soviet Union, not Britain, not Germany. I gave it away. It's Britain. Why? What does Britain have? What is, what is Britain's threat? Are the, Huh? The, the Commonwealth, the, the sterling, the sterling block. Britain controls the greatest empire, and no one else can get in it. They trade with themselves, right? So one of one of America's major goals in the 30s and 40s is going to be to get into the sterling block, to get into the British Empire. The Soviet Union, not really. I mean, and after World War II, sure, but before that, the Soviet Union is fairly weak. Germany isn't really a threat until, you know, Hitler kind of goes overboard in the late 30s and decides to take over the whole world and not just Central Europe. But actually, Britain poses a greater threat to America's overall ambitions because Britain controls global commerce in ways that Germany and certainly the Soviet Union don't, right? So this is kind of what they're talking about. Now, the flip side of that. Um, so the United States goes in, and, and the war against Cuba is fairly quick. It's, it's kind of, you know, in and out kind of a thing. Um, what happens after that? What happens after that? The United States went in there because the Spanish were terrible, right? They were treating them badly, and they were an imperial power. All right, so what's the assumption there, then? Liberate Cubans. Liberate the Cubans, right? Yeah. I think one of the next things was the Pride Amendment. Did a Cuban yeah, yeah, I'm that. that. It's kind of kind of setting it up. So, I mean, but but the basis for it was we're here to liber we're here to liberate you, right? So, in 1898, Cuba is liberated, and what did the Cubans say to the to the Americans? Thank you. We love you. Go home. Right. Right. Well, was that the plan? You know, that was the rhetoric, right? We're here for liberation and so on and so forth. But in fact, um, uh, William McKinley had promised Cuba free and independent status, but. Only once there was, quote, complete tranquility and also, quote, stable government on the island. We're here to liberate you, we love you, and we're going to give you free and independent status, you're going to run your own country, but when there is complete tranquility and stable government. Now, complete tranquility and stable government, as we've seen in Iraq, are not all that easy to come by. Within two months of the American victory, which was very easy, Elihu Root who was the American Secretary of State, feared that the United States and Cuba was, quote, on the verge daily of some sort of thing that happened to us, of the same sort of thing that happened to us in the Philippines. What was happening in the Philippines? I'll go into more detail on that. In the Philippines, a major bloody insurrection had begun that would last 10 years. Root fears the same thing happening in Cuba. In Cuba, the American occupation is run by General Leonard Wood. He's the Bremer of Cuba at the time. He wanted to annex Cuba, but the administration didn't want to do that because if you annex a country, if you actually take it and acquire it, what does that make you? An empire, an imperialist. They don't want to do that. They want to run Cuba, they want to control Cuba, but they don't want to own it. All right. So, um, Wood, Wood actually wants to annex it, but that's not the plan. The plan is actually to bring Cuba into America's orbit, but not as an annexation, as a free and fair partner. All right. Uh, somebody asks, would then, according to McKinley, who said stable government was necessary, when will Cuba be stable? And Leonard Wood says, and this is interesting, he could have said when they create, when they elect their own people, when they have a, a city council, when they have a legislature. He could have said, you know, when they have democracy. But this is Leonard Wood's answer. When will Cuba be stable? Wood says, when money can be borrowed at a reasonable rate of interest and when capital is willing to invest in the island, then a condition of stability will be reached. He's talking about borrowing and, and buying money and investing capital. This is how the U.S. will determine Cuban stability, not through political institutions, but through investment. That's globalization. The Americans also talking about the civilizing impact we talked about. Earlier. The Americans begin to work with Cuban elites. All right? 
mostly Spanish Cuban elites. Lighter skin, Spanish Cuban elites, not the, you, you know, Juan had mentioned that 50% of the island was Afro-Cuban, many, many sla mostly slaves. Those people were still, their, their, their status didn't really change hardly at all. Americans work with Cuban elites, they speak English, and in fact, English language instruction becomes required in all the schools. Why? If you're going to do business with the United States, you best speak English, right? Cubans never would understand the Americans, the U.S. believed, until they appreciated American culture, American language, American institutions. They want, not only do they want to think, you know, kind of work with them and make money, but they wanted to love us, too. Uh, Elihu Root, uh, who was the Secretary of State, and a senator from Connecticut named Orville Platt got together and they formed a political relationship. And in an appropriations bill uh, in 1901, the government included something called the Platt Amendment. And the Platt Amendment said that Cuba could not make a treaty with any nation that might impair its independence. And who would determine that? The U.S. would. If Cuban independence was threatened, and who would determine that? The United States would. Or if it failed to protect life, property, and individual liberty, then the U.S. had the right to do what? Intervene, Intervene in Cuba. The Platt Amendment basically says, Cuba, you have no sovereignty. We will not allow you to make any agreement with a country that might violate your sovereignty, as we define it. And if you make some kind of an agreement, or if another country takes actions in your country that violate your sovereignty, as we define it, then we have the right to intervene. All right? Now, that's not a colony. Cuba's not a colony. Remember that. Right? That's, that's kind of, that's the difference between liberal imperialism and European imperialism. All right? In the real world, no, you're right. It, it doesn't make much difference. But but the but 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 the structures are very different, and those are important. I was just wondering if, if any of these guys realize the hypocrisy of what they're doing. If they're well, it's not hypocrisy. I mean, it's you know, that's the way the world is structured. Little little brown people south of the equator. You know, if you look at the literature at this time, the word most commonly used to describe anybody who's not white is nigger, and that's in Asia. It's in Latin America. Anywhere. You know, Mexicans, uh, although actually Teddy Roosevelt called people in Santa the Dominican Republic, he called them Dagos, too. So. But, I mean, but there's this real derisive language used all the time. They're inferior. So it's not like a hypocrisy. You know what? Those people can't survive on their own. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yes, and there is another reason for not annexing those territories, and that, that is that there are those that wanted to integrate them as states. And if you do, you have to... I mean, you raise the issue of citizenship. Yeah, there was a racist, a racist argument against yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. equality. You don't want those people yeah. to become citizens. Yeah, there was this real kind of, you know, white supremacist idea. We don't want these people coming in. They, you know, we have enough. We, we want to get rid of our, our blacks, and we want to get rid of our Mexicans and that kind of thing. We don't want to bring more into Yeah, there's a, a really strong white argument against that, too. And labor, of course. Organized labor doesn't want them in because they take jobs away, right? Yes, and also, yeah, yeah, you keep them out. That way you can, you can, you can exploit them economically. You can pay nothing. And which is you bring and, and that's a more effective yeah. system. It's not, I mean, you know, there's, there's the kind of, and, and I'm not in any way going to make a pro-imperial argument, but there is kind of a pro-imperial argument that if you bring people in, you actually have to take care of them to some extent. You, you, you know, it's, it's like the argument between slavery and free labor. Basically, you could argue that free labor is actually more exploitive. You have no responsibility to take care of somebody in a free labor system, whereas in a slave system, you actually do. And this is the same argument that could be made there. Actually, we're exploiting them better by not bringing them in, by not integrating them. Then they become citizens, there are minimum wage laws, welfare laws, you name it. This way, yeah, we'll just set up a sweatshop overseas. Mine was the same. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> Leonard Wood. Okay, uh, we'll leave him with the last word on Cuba. He said, you cannot understand the Platt Amendment unless you know something about the character of Kaiser Wilhelm. <laughs> and then he said, when asked to comment on the Platt Amendment, there is, of course, little or no independence left in Cuba under the Platt Amendment. Very honest, isn't he? Now I mentioned the Philippines. Any questions on Cuba? Pretty, pretty easy stuff. Right? I mentioned the Philippines. At the same time that the U.S. was attacking Cuba, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who had been the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, sent a fleet under the command of Admiral Dewey to the Philippines. All right? And why? Because the Philippines was a Spanish colony. 
and under the theory that if Spain was bad in Cuba, it was also bad in the Philippines, the U.S. decides to liberate the Philippines as well. Did it have any standing under international law to do this? No. I mean, Cuba was done under the pretext of the main being blown up and all kinds of other diplomatic protocols. Philippines wasn't at all. All right. William McKinley actually later said that he got on his knees and prayed to God and God told him to take the Philippines. I'm not making that up. I have the, I'm not going to read it because it's very long, but this was McKinley's explanation. Um, so the U.S. takes the Philippines in 1898. What do the Filipinos think about this? Like the Cubans, the Filipinos had been revolting against the Americans. They had been led by somebody named Emiliano Aguinaldo. And um, Aguinaldo was kind of like a George Washington figure revered by the Filipinos. He had been leading the revolt against the Spanish. Now the Americans take over. And just like the Cubans, the Filipinos say, thank you, we appreciate it, we love you, good job, take care, see ya. And the Americans in the same way say, no, we're not leaving, right? We have to teach you democracy. We have to teach you self-determination, right? And so the Filipinos decide that they're not going to tolerate this. So where they had been in revolt against the Spanish, they are now in revolt against the Americans. And the insurrection uh, begins, uh, uh, you know, pretty much uh, immediately. Um, the Americans now uh, find themselves in a bloody uh, uprising. It's hard to kind of find the proper language for this, I mean, because the U.S. did not have actual legal standing to control the Philippines, so to call it an insurrection implies that the Filipinos were acting up against the legitimate authority, when in fact the Americans weren't the legitimate authority there. No matter what language you use, however, many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Filipinos were taking up arms against the Americans. And pretty soon, well over 10,000 American Marines are in uh, the Philippines fighting against this insurrection. Uh, <clears throat> Albert Beveridge, who is a well-known senator, I quoted a little bit earlier, an imperialist, very candidly spoke of America's interest in the Philippines. And he said, Mr. President, the times call for candor. The Philippines are ours forever. And just beyond the Philippines are China's illimitable markets. We will not retreat from either. We will not renounce our part in the mission of our race. Trustee under God of the civilization of the world. The Pacific is our ocean. Where shall we turn for consumers of our surplus? Geography answers the question. China is the natural customer. The Philippines give us a base at the door of all of the East. No land in America surpasses in fertility the plains and valleys of Luzon, Philippines. Rice and coffee, sugar and coconuts, hemp and tobacco. The wood of the Philippines can supply the furniture of the world for a century to come. At Cebu, the best informed man on the island told me that 40 miles of Cebu's mountain chain are practically mountains of coal. I have a nugget of pure gold picked in its present form on the banks of a Philippine creek. My own belief is that there are not 100 men among them who comprehend what Anglo-Saxon self-government even means. And there are over 5 million people to be governed. It has been charged that our conduct in the war has been cruel. Senators, it has been the reverse. Senators must remember that we are not dealing with Americans or Europeans. We are here dealing with Orientals. That's a speech on the Senate floor. Yeah. Wasn't there a policy soon formed, that, um, military policy, that they were to kill every man, or every male over the age of 10? There were, in particular, engagements, those kinds of atrocities in terms of an overall. I mean, about 100,000 people died, so it was quite bloody. It wasn't quite that systematic. Um, but in fact, I mean, you had uh, uh, letters coming home. There was a group called the World Anti-Imperialist League, which I'll mention later. It's actually run by Mark Twain. And they were against the Filipino thing. It was a big issue. And it's kind of funny because it's barely even mentioned if it is at all in the history books. But this was huge. This was like really a kind of a global issue. I mean, over 100,000 Filipinos died in 10 years and about 10,000 American Marines died too. So it was really bloody and, and ugly. Um, uh, uh, one, one soldier wrote back, um, with my own hand, uh, uh, he said, I had, with my own hands, set fire to over 50 houses of Filipinos after the victory at Calican. Women and children were wounded by our fire. One uh, soldier from Washington State wrote, Our fighting blood was up, and we all wanted to kill niggers. 
This shooting human being sure beats rabbit hunting all the pieces. So there was this, and again, you see this as this kind of denigration, it's like kind of depriving people of their humanity. So you compare it uh, to rabbit, you know, hunting or, or something like that. Um, this is, you know, kind of relentless. Uh, one American general returning to the U.S. from southern Luzon said, one-sixth of the natives of Luzon have been killed or have died of the dengue fever in the last few years. The loss of life by killing alone has been very great, but I think not one man has been slain except where his death has served the legitimate purposes of war. It has been necessary to adopt what in other countries would probably be thought harsh measures. In other countries, these would be considered harsh measures, but not here because it's required. All right. Now, again, to you know, kind of bring up an obvious and you know, kind of staged question, but think about it. How is going in, you know, to an area and killing, you know, one sixth of the population different than flying an airplane into a building or piling up, you know, huge? I mean, you have pictures. This isn't, you know, just apocryphal. You have photos of, of literally thousands of Filipinos stacked, you know, bodies just stacked up in these massive mounds of of, of corpses. All right. Um, in fact, one, one Marine uh, uh, who was a major was accused of shooting 11 Filipino uh, civilians uh, unarmed and so forth. Uh, he, on trial, uh, he testified, the major, this, the, the, this is a third party thing, Littleton Waller was his name, Waller said that General Smith instructed him to kill and burn and said that the more he killed and burned, the better pleased he would be, that it was no time to take prisoners and that he was to make Samar a howling wilderness. Major Waller asked General Smith to define the age limit for killing and he replied, everything over 10. <coughs> All right. Mark Twain, who was probably the greatest commentator on this, wrote, we have pacified, and he, he, Twain was a smart ass, Twain wrote, we have pacified some thousands of islanders and buried them, destroyed their fields, burned their villages, and turned their widows and orphans out of doors, furnished heartbreak by exile to some dozens of disagreeable patriots, subjugated the remaining 10 millions by benevolent assimilation, which is the pious new name of the musket. We have acquired property in the 300 concubines and other slaves of our business partner, the Sultan of Sulu, and we've hoisted our protecting flag over that swag. And so by these provinces of God and the phrases, the government's not mine, we are now a world power. Right? General Douglas MacArthur, who would know a thing or two about the Philippines in World War II, later wrote, I believe that Aguinaldo's troops, and he was talking about, you know, kind of the, 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 the sense of how the Filipinos uh, uh, accepted the Americans, because the Americans kept saying they love us here, it's the, the same old stuff, right? They love us here, they want us here, we're doing God's work here. MacArthur even said, I believe that Aguinaldo's troops represented only a faction. I did not like to believe that the whole population of Luzon, the native population, was opposed to us. But MacArthur said he was reluctantly compelled to believe that the Filipino army, because it was fighting a guerrilla war, depended upon almost complete unity of action of the entire native population. MacArthur is admitting that the Filipinos hated the Americans for what they had done. All right? So by the early 1900s, the United States, by force, has taken over Cuba and the Philippines and denied them their autonomy. The Philippines was actually colonized and would remain so until July 4th, 1946. Cuba wasn't. Cuba was an American protectorate under the aegis of the Pratt Amendment. The Platt Amendment, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, 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 in both of these cases, the United States, you know, uh, uh, beset by economic problems at home, overproduction, surplus capital, needing markets, having great investments, decides to go abroad in a very aggressive way. Now, in the real world, it's not really significantly different than anything the Europeans are doing. However, coming out of that, coming out of the, um, the, the Cuban-Filipino, it's, it's often referred to as the Spanish-American War, but nowadays you start to see it referred to as like the Spanish-American-Cuban-Filipino War and all kinds of long, you call it whatever you want. But coming out of that, the United States now has kind of its ideology and its plan, its program for global conquest, and it's going to be based more than anything on the open door. Okay. Um, as a result, actually, let me, let me do a little map thing here. This is what the one I showed you. Wait, is that the one I want? Here we go. Um, but this is a result. This, these green spots, can, 
you can kind of see that pretty well. Let me make it a little wrong way. This is what America, the United States, uh, 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 acquired in 1898. All right, Cuba, which isn't listed, Puerto Rico is, and then all of these territories in the Pacific, the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, Hawaii, it finally brings in in 1898, uh, Samoa, you know, kind of, you kind of get the point. Now, why are these islands important? Economically, they're not terribly important. You know, pineapples and things like that. But why is this stuff really important? Asia and coaling, Asia and coaling stations, right? If you want to go from here to here, you know, and Japan and China are really crucial. You can't go all the way. You don't have, you know, these big, huge nuclear-powered carriers, and you don't have jets, right? So you have to have coaling stations midway. These are really critical which is why in World War II, these are all going to be the site of major battles, right? So the U.S. now has clearly an empire, and especially a Pacific empire, which is really critical in this period, right? And from there, then, they will move out, and they will try to create a global open door. I've talked about, the, I've used the phrase before, but open door really becomes important. And this is essentially the story of the 20th century. You're going to get sick of hearing me say open door, right? It's a very simple process. In 1899, the Secretary of State, William Hay, sends a series of notes out to major uh, 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 capitals of major countries. And he says, and this is talking about China. And he says, in China, there must be an open door for trade. It's really simple stuff. What is an open door? What does the open door mean? Free trade. It just means you don't have tariffs, you don't have subsidies, you don't have barriers. Everybody trades. Everybody has equal access. That's all it means. It's really simple. And again, why is Hay doing this? And why this is not traditional imperialism. Why why is Hay doing this? What is America's strength? Economic power, production. It's not a military power. It can, it can, you know, well, look at the trouble it had subduing the Philippines. I mean, that was, that was a difficult campaign. But even more than that, um, it was, uh, uh, um, the United States was not a military power. This is a, a, a beautiful uh, thing I did uh, last year, and I just kind of put it on there. But this is my, uh, can <laughs> this is kind of the difference between European and open door imperialism. In Europe, you have like an imperial system. So the British control India or Egypt, or the French control Indochina. Those markets are closed, right? The French trade with Indochina. The British trade with India. And it is very difficult to get in. According to the open door, the world is open, which means you have access to everything. There's no closed system. This is all it means. It's really simple stuff. Under the open door, the US has access to the markets of the world. In an imperial system, markets are closed. That's all it means. Open door, it's just a metaphor. The open door for trade. A closed door. What's a closed door? Tariffs. You know what tariffs are, right? What's a tariff? Tax on trade, right? So under the, the tariff, you know, a closed door system would have tariffs, right? Uh, uh, but under the open door, you don't have that. You don't have tariffs, you, tariff, you don't have barriers. Everything is open. There's a free field of commerce. Ultimately, this is a far more effective form of empire than the forces of occupation. Because what happened when the United States uh, 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 forcibly went into the Philippines? What was the result of that? I mean, a long, bloody insurrection, which they were able to subdue. Nonetheless, clearly, uh, 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 you know, what happens, and I'll talk about this later if any of you know European history, what happens in, uh, in uh, South Africa at the turn of the century? Boer War. A long, bloody war, right? Now, what would you rather have? Would you rather send your troops over in long, bloody, costly wars, which create incredible animosity and you know, create alliances in different political contexts, or would you rather send your businessmen over to establish trade relations via the open door? The idea there, which is essentially what John Adams and all those guys were talking about in the late 1700s, was a commercial relationship. We will trade with anybody and avoid entanglements. That's the open door. That's globalization. This is clearly an example of globalization, isn't it? Where the United States sets out to create global opportunities. Now it's going to do so coercively. And that's going to be the anomaly, the real contradiction of liberalism. Liberalism should not ever act by force. It shouldn't have to. 
right? The idea of liberalism is that people have freedom to make these choices, especially these commercial choices. But it doesn't work out that way, does it? The Filipinos didn't choose to come under the protection of the United States any more than the Cubans after 1898. The Cubans welcomed American intervention to free them from the Spanish, no doubt about that. But the Cubans didn't welcome the Platt Amendment. They didn't welcome Leonard Wood running their country and saying that you know banking was the, 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 the keystone to stability. Right? So they welcome liberalism, but at the same time, it didn't work, did it? Because the U.S. has to resort to force and coercion. And that's going to become the anomaly, the kind of inconsistency, the contradiction of liberal empire, is it resorts to force. Right? Because it's not welcomed in. Liberalism would, in fact, you know, essentially rule by example. In the Philippines, they would have said, oh, what a great system. See you, goodbye. The Americans would have left and they would have established it, right? It's not going to work that way. It's not going to. And the Americans recognize that because most of these countries are underdeveloped and they have to go through their own form of economic evolution. You know, what did the United States, what kind of economic policies did it have in the early 1800s? If any of you have taken, you know, the first part of the history, you should know that. What kind of, what was the, what was the, big, the big political crisis of 1828 in South Carolina? What was it about? Was it, was it trade between different states? Well, and what in particular, though? What, you're, you're and the different currencies. And well, it wasn't the currencies. It was something else. Tariffs. Tariffs, yeah. right? All right. The big crisis was over tariffs. The United States had a protectionist economy. That wasn't a liberal open-door economy. Could any country come into the U.S. and trade in the 1800s? Or they said, no. How, how did the United States develop a, a textile and a, and, a, and, a, and a manufacturing industry? Who, who, who provided for that? The federal government did by tax breaks and subsidies. Who built the railroads? Or who, 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 gave, who, who provided the land for the railroads? Federal government granted, land grants worth 22 million acres. So the United States wasn't a liberal economy. But what the US is saying is that, you know, we can't let you develop and evolve that way. We don't have enough time, right? Now, liberalism would mean that you evolve. You naturally develop that. But that doesn't happen in Cuba or the Philippines. So liberalism becomes coercive. And as soon as it becomes coercive, it's not liberal anymore which is why you have this problem. And this is something we can talk about more, and it's going to be a common, there's going to be a lot of common themes that we've done most of the day today. What I want to do when we pick up is talk a little bit about people who criticize this, because just as these kind of themes of empire and globalization and war are very prevalent, there's also been an attack on it from the start. And uh, we will um, talk more about that. And in all of this stuff, we're going to play more with as we go on. So. Um, Great class. See you next week.